Just imagine this for a second. You hop into a time machine and land all the way back between 635 million and 538.8 million years ago. But why on earth would you choose to travel to that particular time period? The reason's pretty simple. You wanted to go hunting or fishing in the Edia Karen era, a time no one else ever dares to visit. That's right, you're gonna post it on Insta and not be embarrassed even if your friends see it. Hey everyone, welcome back! The moment you step out of the time machine, you'll realize you couldn't have picked a worse time or place for a vacation. There are no fish here, no big birds, no animals to chase, nothing. In fact, not only are there no large birds or beasts, there's not a single tiny creature crawling around on land either. And to top it off, it's not exactly cozy out here, it's actually freezing cold. Welcome to our channel everyone! Which means it's time to warm things up a little. So, what kind of things and creatures are waiting for us in the Adia Karen era? Let's find out! Life in the Seas of Edia Kara Let's try some surf fishing on the shores of ancient Edia Kara. Not a single bite! Alright, time to switch out the rod and see if that helps. We wait. Still nothing, not even a nibble. And that's with a fat, juicy worm on the hook, one any fish would dream of. This isn't just any worm either, it came straight from your special weekend stash, a jar packed with irresistible treats that fish are supposed to love. At this point, you can't help but wonder, what in the world is actually happening beneath the surface of the water? So you slip on a pair of special goggles designed to help you spot sea life more clearly. But what you're about to see probably won't bring a smile to your face. The sea floor is absolutely teeming with life. But you won't recognize a single thing down there. Are they animals? Plants? Maybe fungi? These creatures have no arms, no legs, no backs, no heads. No features at all, really. If you're a paleontologist, you'd recognize them as Pteridinium. It's one of the most iconic species from the Edia Karen era. Truly bizarre. No mouth, no digestive tract, no eyes, not even anything that looks like antennae. What you can see is that this creature is made of three parts, each one featuring a set of parallel rib-like segments. One curious detail, this primitive life form is asymmetrical. What seems completely normal to us today, bilateral symmetry, wasn't common at all back in the Edia Karen. In fact, it was rare. Pteridinium always grew in colonies, and the wings of each colony looked strangely like quilted mattresses. Its body, flat and plate-like, jutted out from the seafloor like the stalk of a plant, and could grow as long as three feet. Scientists believe these creatures didn't move at all, instead absorbing nutrients directly from the water through photosynthesis or osmosis. So naturally, that worm dangling from your fishing line wouldn't count as food to them. They don't even have eyes to see that it's a worm in the first place. And that's exactly why scientists created a whole new classification just for them, something neither plant nor animal, the Vendobionta. In fact, most of the creatures from this time can't be neatly categorized as either plant or animal. The entire Ediacaran world was fundamentally different from today's kingdoms of plants and animals. Take Parvin Carina, for example. This odd little creature was flat, triangular, and just about half an inch across, with a bulge shaped like a boat anchor. While it kind of resembles a tiny crustacean, it had no claws, no eyes, and no antenna. But there does appear to be something like a head or even teeth on the end of its back. And just as strange is Yorgia Wagoneri. Researchers were baffled by this flat, disc-like creature which could range from less than half an inch to over eight inches wide. No legs, no fins. How in the world did it move across the seafloor? Did it somehow float up off the bottom and drift to a new spot? Or did it actually jump? Both Pteridinium and Yorgia had hollow spaces inside their bodies, which allowed them to take in seawater and expand. Like most animals of the Edia Karen period, Yorgia was asymmetrical too. One half of its disc-shaped body was always slightly offset from the other. Now, here's another Edia Karen life form that looked kinda like a worm. This one was called Sprigina, a tiny prehistoric worm only about one to two inches long. But of course, it wasn't a worm at all. 
at that size, it may well have been one of the first predators to ever live on Earth. You can tell from the plates lined up along its lower body, like armor protecting a hunter. And just like the others, this adorable little guy doesn't fit neatly into any known biological group. Not fungus, not animal, not plant. So scientists, in the end, decided to boldly group Sprigina in with the Vendobianta. Dickinsonia, however, is one we can confidently say belongs to the animal kingdom. In fact, scientists discovered traces of cholesterol in fossilized Dickinsonia remains, proving once and for all that it was a true animal. Still, you'd never guess that from its appearance alone. Dickinsonia looked like a giant wavy disc, sometimes up to 5 feet wide, resting gently like a piece of seaweed on the ocean floor. But here's a puzzle. If its food supply was right underneath it in thick, nutrient-rich layers, why would it ever bother to move? If it could absorb food through its entire body, what use would a mouth even be? Mouths didn't show up until a little later, toward the end of the Ediacaran period. That's when we start to see creatures like the Claudinidae. These soft-bodied animals had what looked like a hollow mouth, probably used to eat other living organisms. Which means the age-old story of bloodshed and predation started way, way back. And toward the end of the Ediacaran, some organisms had evolved even further. That's when we first see creatures with actual legs. Leading the charge was a little multi-legged crawler named Yelingia spikiformis. This tiny pioneer was the first creature in Earth's history to leave tracks across the ocean floor at the close of the Proterozoic. But creatures like Yelingia marked the beginning of the end for those thick, rich mats of nutrients covering the sea floor, and ultimately, they closed off an alternate evolutionary path for life on Earth. Without these newcomers, this world might have ended up ruled by lazy, gooey slimes that just absorbed nutrients through their skin and called it a day. It's hard to picture any kind of intelligence developing in a body like that. Sure, some sci-fi stories might imagine it, but let's be honest, it's not exactly convincing. Ediacaran Life on Land So, fishing in the waters of Ediacara was a total bust. Maybe things will go better if we try our luck hunting on land. Unfortunately, it's actually much worse. Because in this era, not a single living thing had made it onto land. And really, how could any land-based life have appeared right after a global ice age that covered most of the Earth for millions of years? It wasn't until the tail end of the Proterozoic, what we now call the Ediacaran period, that the climate finally began to warm up noticeably. That warming trend is what helped drive the explosive development of marine life. But even then, nothing had yet made the leap to dry land. In fact, we now know that even during that supposedly warm period, there were at least two major ice ages. One was the Glaskier's glaciation, which lasted 340,000 years, between 579.88 and 579.63 million years ago. The other was the Baconurian glaciation, which spanned a whopping 6 million years, from 547 to 541 million years ago. So, it looks like we'll have to give up on hunting too. This little time travel getaway is turning out to be a big disappointment. And on top of that, it's starting to get cold. Even at the peak of summer, the air temperature outside in Ediacara drops below 63 degrees Fahrenheit. And the sun? It looks hazy and dim, not warming and welcoming. You're starting to feel lightheaded and short of breath, almost like you're running out of oxygen. It's probably time to pack up the tent and head back to your own time. That would be a smart decision. The air in Ediacara was much thinner than we're used to, and its overall composition was totally different. There was a whole lot more carbon dioxide, and the oxygen level was less than 15% of what we breathe today. Still, for a time traveler, this was lucky. Because if you'd landed just 200 million years earlier, you'd need an oxygen mask just to survive for even a single minute. Back then, atmospheric oxygen was less than 1% of today's levels. Toward the end of the Proterozoic, though, things were slowly improving, especially when it came to carbon dioxide. That's because the glaciations that came before had been packed with non-stop volcanic eruptions, pumping enormous amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. By the end of the Cryogenian period, carbon dioxide levels had shot up to more than 350 times what they are today. 
that thick blanket of CO2 triggered a powerful greenhouse effect, which led to a sudden burst of global warming. And thanks to that, the Ediacaran period had this short window of time when it was actually possible to breathe. So no, your dream of a peaceful hike along the river or a walk through nature by the sea didn't come true. And just so you know, rivers didn't even exist yet in this era. So what did exist back then? What you had were massive tidal shifts, much stronger and more extreme than anything we see today. Around the end of the Ediacaran, the supercontinent Panatea, located near the equator, began to break apart. This huge landmass, surrounded by ancient oceans, would later split during the Cambrian into Gondwana, Siberia, and Laurentia. And it was from Gondwana that, during the Jurassic period, today's continents, Eurasia, Africa, North and South America began to take shape. So as you can imagine, the landscapes of Ediacara looked absolutely nothing like what we know now. Even with a modern map in your pocket, it wouldn't help you one bit out here. But if you happen to have a map of Panatea, it might have come in handy. For a little while at least. In the end, the only place those Vendobianta creatures ever called home was the ocean that surrounded the supercontinent. But when that massive landmass broke apart, those one-of-a-kind life forms disappeared right along with it. As much as we hate to admit it, Homo sapiens like us wouldn't have stood a chance in the world of Ediacara. No food, no air, and obviously no internet, no air conditioning, no nothing. Still, this was a groundbreaking moment in Earth's history. It marked the arrival of the very first multicellular life. Before that, for more than three billion years, Earth was stuck in a deep freeze of soul-crushing silence, broken only by the roar of tsunamis and the explosive rage of erupting volcanoes. If you enjoyed today's video, please make sure to subscribe, give a thumbs up and share it on your favorite social media. We truly appreciate each and every one of you watching. Until next time, take care and goodbye for now.